Testing, is this on? Oh. That one's on. We see who matters. Okay, okay. Hello, hello. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> My name is Taylor McPartland. I'm the co-founder of Film Break, and I'm very honored to be here with all of you and with the amazing panelists that we have up here. <laughs> <laughs> ready to talk about crowdfunding so thank you all for coming out and bringing your checkbooks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. who here has run a campaign before a crowdfunding campaign who here is thinking about running a campaign uh -huh. who here has been asked by someone that they might not have ever met to donate to their campaign <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> There's a lot of talk going on about uh, about crowdfunding and where it's going and equity crowdfunding and, and whatnot. And, and we're here to really focus uh, at a granular, granular level on where crowdfunding is at right now. Uh, although what a lot of people don't realize is that there's there's a lot of opportunity um, in the crowdfunding space um, that might relate to people that might not otherwise have considered this is an avenue to go for their upcoming project. We want to get into that. And then we want to explore what it takes to get a campaign off the ground. It's another area that's uh, really underdeveloped, and it's an area that takes a lot of time and effort. And um, we've got some great panelists up here to talk about that. So before we dive into it, I would just like to quickly go down the line and have everyone take 30 seconds and introduce yourselves. Starting here? <laughs> okay. Might as well. Uh, I'm Michael, and that's my last name. Um, <laughs> I'm really not a, a crowdfunding expert. I'm a writer and producer. I, I created a lot of television shows. I created Baywatch, which most people know. Um, I wrote a movie last year called uh, Soul Surfer with, with uh, about Bethany Hamilton, the mm -hmm. girl who had her arm bitten off by a shark. And I'm producing a lot of movies and, and, and met Taylor at a, uh, a group a uh, panel like this where I was out there and he was up here with a bunch of people and I thought this is a great way to avoid having to deal with the bullshit of raising money for, for film and television projects. There's lots of other crowdfunding types of projects, but specifically for film and television, you know, there's you're always going to get ripped off and, and you're always going to you know, never be able to realize the profits that you deserve. So uh, I began kind of working with Taylor on, on uh, strategies for crowdfunding for some of my projects and for projects in general. And I've got some opinions um, and I'd love to share them. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Schultz. Uh, I'm a producer as well. I produce mostly for television um, and animation. Uh, I produced um, Garfield and the Simpsons and King of the Hill and Clifford the Big Red Dog, a little bit of everything along the way. And uh, the crowdfunding thing is something that uh, I think is an amazing thing for all the reasons that Michael said, the idea of sort of bypassing the gatekeepers who have their own corporate interests in mind, uh, which you know may not be a meritocracy in terms of the creative and in terms of reaching and connecting with an audience. So I think it's a really exciting thing. We're, we're running a campaign right now for a a new animated half hour series with the creator from Dexter called Jimmy Stones. And uh, I'm learning Where can a lot. they see that? JimmyStonesTV.com. Thanks. Nice. <laughs> JimmyStonesTV. That's JimmyStonesTV.com. What was it? Uh, JimmyStonesTV.com. <laughs> JimmyStonesTV. There you go. Yeah. PC PC the Matic. PC Matic. Um, so, anyhow, I'm. I, happy to be here to share my experiences. I'm coming from selling to networks for 25 years and now selling to, you know, at least 300 and something million people. So we'll uh, learn together. Ah, very good. Anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Scott Page and uh, kind of my claim to fame. I'm an artist, been an artist, entrepreneur kind of guy. My music side, I'm kind of known for my, my sort of my claim to fame is I'm a saxophone player in Pink Floyd. 
from that, though, during those days on the road, I was always reading business books because I wanted to be a business guy. And I remember Dave Gilmore, the guitar player, would always say, what are you doing? I'll read these books in search of excellence and all this. I'm going to have me a business. Well, luckily, after one of the tours, I went out and started a company called Walt Tucker after my two heroes, Walt Disney and Preston Tucker, the car manufacturer, because of their thing. Later, next thing I did, I started following, following into the tech space and uh, was one of the first guys that really got into the the whole early days of tech. And actually one of my fam favorite claims to fame is there's a book called The 50 Pioneers of Multimedia. And I got to be one of those guys because <laughs> I was there early. Yay! Uh, so anyway, uh, my background has been in that. So I went started a company called Seventh Level, um, which we ended up taking public 18 months afterwards. We were in the uh, CD-ROM business and we created a lot of education. We actually worked with, uh, from Bobby's Howie. word with Howie Mandel, we did a whole series of edu little Howie's uh, great word adventure, a bunch of educational things. Since then, um, I've launched a variety of companies through time. But in the last few years, I've really gotten over the last five years this whole concept of what's happening in presence management online and the ability that you know we're right now we're at a point where the model is completely shifted where it used to be you know kind of hundreds of thousands of companies and millions of customers. Now it's millions of companies and thousands of customers, and uh, been really focusing on the idea of of realizing that this is the great time in history for the independent artist because dude I have more power here in my hand than NBC had 10 years ago if you think about it I can go build audience I can grow it and more importantly I can take the order so the key is is how do you learn how to build and create stuff and now we'll get into why I think crowdfunding is more important not just from the crowdfunding part of receiving the money but it's really about building those relationships in that fan base is where you can really use that opportunity because as soon as they give you money Right. As soon as they hand you a check, now you've got a super fan, somebody that you can nurture, that can you can go, that will get behind your support you and everything else. Anyway, that's my background. Next, <laughs> kind of getting off tangent. Hey guys, I'm Darren Marble. Um, I did not create Baywatch. I did not produce The Simpsons. I don't have any groupies. But the Marvel comic series. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a wife and two kids. Marbles. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, you what am I doing on this panel? You were, just think you were I'm here. In the wrong room. You just we were here. The guy that invented the marble. <laughs> so I'm the co-founder and co-founder of Film Break. It's an honor to be here. Uh, we're a crowdfunding agency, so we are, act as an intermediary between creators uh, and platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Uh, we're 100% focused and oriented on rewards-based campaigns. Our clients include filmmakers, celebrities, corporations, tech startups, and nonprofits alike. And uh, looking forward to chatting with you guys. So thanks. My name is Kia Kiso, and I'm a producer. The beginning of my producing career was as a line producer. People would come to me with money, and I would deliver their baby, and then they'd run away with it, and I never got to see it again. And I was a bit more like a midwife. And uh, then I started producing some of my own content, but still, you know, distribution part was still a little unclear to me. And um, you know, I've, I've produced things for CBS promos, web series, pilots, uh, feature documentaries, and my friends came to me with a feature documentary they had in mind. They had already shot it, and uh, they're like, okay, we need to distribute it. We need your help because I tend to be pretty bossy, and they're like, we need somebody to organize us, and we want you to distribute it and market it, and I had never done that before. I was like, I don't know how we're going to do it. They're like, don't worry about it. We're going to get into Sundance. We're going to be rich. It's going to be amazing. I was like, I know it doesn't work that way. So uh, they told me they were do, going to do a Kickstarter campaign for finishing funds. And um, once that launched, and it took a lot of work to launch it, we'll talk about that, I realized I could turn that Kickstarter campaign into a marketing campaign, yeah. into distribution, yeah. and into future projects because we now have fans. And uh, the movie is called Mile, Mile and a Half. It's a hiking documentary about a group of artists that hiked the John Muir Trail for 25 days. So we were able to identify our niche audience. We're now on iTunes, Netflix, Vudu, Google Play, Sony PlayStation. We're going to be on Nat Geo internationally. And we started that all with Kickstarter. This is, would have not been... Um, we would not have had these opportunities even a couple years ago, five years ago. We would have been showing this to our grandparents and our children. Nobody else would have seen this film. So this is really a magical time. And so I've been in the trenches. I've run a campaign. We raised $85,000 um, and over, over um, a little over 800 backers. So I want to share my experiences with you guys. Yeah. One more applause. Yeah. <laughs> 
the model. Right there. That's the model. So here's the way it's going to work. We're, it's going to be a little bit different tonight. So we're going to spend about the first 45 minutes doing uh, a straightforward panel. Uh, we're going to have the panelists talk a little bit about their experience in crowdfunding and then hopefully give you some really great nuggets on what you can do for potentially for your upcoming campaigns. After that, we're going to have uh, three fantastic uh, active projects or soon to be active projects come up and take about five minutes, describe their current project to all of you, to the panel. And then it's going to be a little bit of a, uh, of a town hall type of Q&A where the panelists are going to be able to ask uh, pointed questions to these, uh, to these presenters. You can ask them questions as well. And uh, it'll give you some great insight into what you need to know when going into and running your campaign. Uh, first question I have, um, we talked a little bit about crowdfunding being catered towards the independents, and it definitely started off as a space for people who didn't necessarily have money and needed to find money. Uh, is that still the case, or is there a shift happening um, where more people can find more value in the crowdfunding process, and then what is that value? Yeah, my, throw my feeling is yes, absolutely. I mean, companies are now looking for validation. It's a wonderful way to validate whether your project is, if it's really valuable. I can tell you a lot of the artists, uh, my focus right now is really working with a lot of independent artists and I force them to go do crowdfunding for a variety of reasons. Number one, it teaches you a discipline. Number two, the most important thing is it helps you build that audience and gives you an opportunity to basically stay with it. So on your point is what I'm seeing more and more is companies, especially like in artists, labels, they're looking for people that know how to build and, and build and grow their brand and actually generate money. We're also seeing major companies are doing these crowd I mean, because of building the audience and the buzz around their product. Even though they could fund it themselves, they still will do the do the campaign. I can remember reading the other day about a couple companies that are doing that, you know, like even Visa or something. They're like walking in doing these crowdfundings to help validate what they're doing. I think Scott's right. Um, we're seeing more of our interesting deals are actually with corporations. So what we're seeing is that wherever innovation arises, corporate America is never far behind. Uh, so one of our predictions is that crowdfunding will become an enterprise play. And to your point, I mean, there already have been companies and Fortune 500 companies like IBM, Dick's Sporting Goods, Chrysler that have launched and executed very successful campaigns. We kind of see three reasons that a corporation might want to launch a campaign, a crowdfunding campaign. One is around consumer engagement. So it's how can they leverage crowdfunding to acquire new customers. The second is to drive innovation, which is a type of campaign IBM did. It's an internal campaign where they seed their employees with money and they vote on different projects. And I think the third is to drive corporate social responsibility. So if you're a Bank of America and you've got some nonprofit charity, maybe Susan G. Komen for the Cure, how can you use crowdfunding, matching donations to you know, create awareness for that cause? Uh, and we think that's a trend that's only going to increase in the future. And one vision is that maybe in five years from now, every Fortune 500 company will have a crowdfunding department. Just like today, they have a social media marketing department, which 10 years ago was unheard of. I think that bastardizes the, pro <laughs> the, the whole process, actually. You know, as soon as corporations start getting involved, I, I think crowdfunding is an emotional thing. People want to help. Yes, a charity is great, you know, but and matching funds is great. But I don't want to help IBM or you know some big company. And 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 I, I remember when I used to try to meet girls in a bar. <laughs> I would walk up. And I, it listen. always goes to that. Right? I would listen. I, I would listen to the guy that they were talking to, and then I would hear how he was blowing it, and then do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is, it's the same thing with crowdfunding. I mean, if corporations are getting into it, and you you have your own projects, I would try to be anti that and figure out a way to emotionally connect to have people support you as an individual. I mean, I don't want to support a corporation that's trying to raise money. They've got their own money and they, they can put up all the money they, they want. So, you know, I just think it's, it's more of an emotional connection from an individual with a project. And, and it's all about the passion and, and, and getting people to want to support your passion and feel the emotional and success that when you have success they feel that fulfillment and it's it's again it's like a movie that you tear up in when the when the uh, hero wins 
So it's like I think of crowdfunding as as a script where you're the lead character and in act one you've set up you know your goal what you're trying to achieve and you create the if you were writing the movie how would this character what would that person have to do which is you to succeed to win to, to convince people to help them storytelling right exactly all it's all it's story. all storytelling story, i think that's yeah. what uh when you talk about corporations entering this space uh no doubt that that uh, the mainstream will follow the underground that that's just the you know that's the story of everything but i do think the story is something that has to kind of pass the sniff test and i think that uh you know philanthropy philanthropic philanthropic <laughs> we'll get that right uh, Let's give them a break. gift giving um you know corporations that get behind charities it's, it's not really crowdfunding it's using crowdfunding platforms and crowdfunding techniques i think so I think you could probably segregate that. But I think when I considered doing crowdfunding, one of the hurdles that I had to get through was what is the story that I'm telling here and not the creative story of, of JimmyStonesTV.com. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm talking about the story. <laughs> Jimmy, I was talking about the story of Bill Schultz, the producer, trying to raise money to produce his project. It's like, well, his why? Passion project. I, you know, it's, but I think as a producer, all of your projects become passion. So is Jimmy Stone's TV the, the most important project that I've ever done? Well, it's, it's the next one and that therefore it is very important. I wouldn't work on something that I wasn't passionate about, but I think the story that I'm talking about is would it pass the sniff test with the industry? Would it pass the sniff test with my family and friends? Would it pass the sniff test of the voice in my head going, what the fuck are you doing? You know, those types of things. And I think that uh, if it does, then you move ahead. But I think as anybody who's sort of on the altar of deciding to do the crowdfunding, think about that. And then, you know, the ultimate thing is if you think you can get an audience, then, you know, I think you can do it. I think we all are aware of the story of, uh, of um, Zach McGrath, you know, having to kind of get over the hurdle of the criticism. And I think in our own worlds, we all sort of potentially face that as well. Just to follow up on, on Michael, what you said, I actually, I disagree. I don't think there's a, a tremendous issue with a corporation running a campaign. It's the same knock that a celebrity gets for running a campaign. Hey, this guy's wealthy. He's got millions of dollars. Why does he need to go to his fans and ask for money? And what critics, in my opinion, don't understand about that scenario is it's about a value exchange between a brand and an, an end user or consumer. Look, there's enough people out there that will pay 10 grand to go sit courtside next to Spike Lee at the Knicks game and that will be a highlight for that person probably for their life so similarly if you've got a corporation that's offering an exclusive experience uh, you know I think that's at the end of the day it comes down between the the brand and the consumer if the consumer perceives value then what does it matter what other people think um, you know we're in a negotiation with a billion dollar corporation it's a retailer they're well known globally they have 500 stores around the world and you know, these guys are thinking, how can we get closer to our consumers? It's not, to your point, uh, Bill, about raising money. They have the money. Uh, the founders could make, you know, make this campaign. It's how do they engage their consumers in a more genuine way. So I don't think it's a dirty thing or something to be uh, critical of. Yeah, I'd agree in the sense that, listen, the beauty is, is this is, it's, this is all crowdsourcing, basically. And the crowd will tell you if they like it or not. They're either going to buy it or they're not going to buy it. If it's quality and it's something of value, he goes back to the thing. It's got to always have value. I always say, everybody, this, it's not about so much about you. It's about what you can do and solve the problem you're solving. If you can figure out how to do that, then it makes it make it, it, it's Well, then it's, it's, it's about what, what they're offering in exchange for this, That's right. you know, this money. It's, you know, there's, there's two different levels. One, I'm going to put up money because I want to help somebody. I believe in what they're saying and what they're selling. The other is I'm going to put up money because I want what they're offering. Mm -hmm. right. I right. want this level of stuff, you know, yeah, yeah of, of things. So that becomes really the key, I think, to a campaign is how creative and what it is that you're offering. Right. Well, well, it's I just think like opening a movie, right? You know, why do some movies do well and their opening weekend and some movies don't? You know, there's a, a lot of factors that go into it, but it's the market. The market plays the word of mouth, the market plays the story, all those pieces. Well, 
with our campaign, we made it like, if you love the trailer so much, then donate to it or else the movie will not exist. You know, it's like, if you believe in this this much, we need you to support it. So we were offering such value. But what you did know? you offer for different levels of... Well, I mean, top? there were also premiums, what right? What was your there top was... premium? What was your top thing that you offered? Uh, I think we we played around with the idea of like, we will come to your house and we will reenact the whole movie in your home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, For how much? I think that was like 10 grand, you know, but I think it was also like, come to the premiere. We offered like, come to the premiere, we'll fly you in, we'll have a party in your honor, those kind of things. But but also it was like, besides the premiums, like if you love it, you've got to support it or else we're, it's not happening. And I know that maybe corporations can't offer something something like that but as a, as a filmmaker and independent you you know that call to action it's not just like you want a t-shirt you want this dvd it's like you believe in me so much that it, it i won't be able to continue without it yes. that's kind of got to be your narrative even if that's not your narrative so where i would go i'd start thinking about how i can become important to the corporation so i can be part of the crowdfunding that they want to do because there's opportunity they're always looking to be able to figure out what's a cool thing that i can get behind or whatever but there's opportunities i think in that way too you know, I, I think not to be cynical, but I think these campaigns are all about the rewards. If you know you fund a campaign, your goal is to raise a hundred grand. Let's say you get your first twenty-five percent in with friends, family, and fans. Which, by the way, you should get that twenty-five percent in on day one. Uh, the other seventy-five percent really is going to come from people that may not care about the project, but they care about the reward. So we encourage clients to think about their campaign as if it were Macy's.com. It's an e-commerce platform. Kickstarter may not tell you they're a store, but they are a store. People are buying goods and services and experiences. They're buying into participation. Mm -hmm. So as you craft your campaign, you really do have to think about why would a complete stranger back this project? Yes, there is an emotional component to it. Yes, people want to see you hit that goal, especially if it's all or nothing on Kickstarter, but it does come down to having a compelling reward where there's value. And that's what you need to focus on for the 75% of people that aren't your friends family or fans. I think sort of migrating away from the question a little bit, but just to follow on what Darren was saying, uh, and something that I've been sort of learning along the way, is that I'm used to pitching in a, a medium with networks and program executives and, uh, and having artwork and being in the room and being able to read a face. And that's the platform I've been working on for 25 years. And, and now I find myself on JimmyStonesTV.com, <laughs> and uh, and I don't have the same tools, and I feel like my pitch isn't as sharp. Um, I was talking with a, a journalist, and I was giving him my pitch of the show, and he goes, "Wow, that's really that's something I really would like to pay to see." And then I said to go to JimmyStonesTV.com, <laughs> and but he but he had been there, and he didn't get the same thing. So I think that what what because it's a new medium i mean it, it is a medium it's a store it's a medium it's a lot of things but i do think that as you consider it you can you can see that it's it's a website that kind of distills down something that you otherwise would probably be pitching very passionate what's your top reward our top reward is i think uh to come to la for a screen i've got a reward for you top reward you will design an animated character after the individual who submits it. They send in the photograph. Right. And then you That's actually, we have that reward. It's not even one of the top ones, though. We're, we're cheaper than that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good reward. Actually, I think, you know, the thing is, is that I don't care who you are and how many projects you've had made and how many projects you've pitched. And I've seen interviews with, you know, uh, everybody from uh, Francis Ford Coppola to... Uh, uh, James Kahn and there was a, a movie recently, we all want to get our projects funded because we are passionate. And I think the thing that I'm trying to get across is that I think the platform of crowdfunding, sometimes passion comes through and sometimes it doesn't. And I don't have an answer to that, but I think that's something that we all should consider. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it's all marketing. It's a marketing engine, right? That's really what it is. And I go back to the fact that, listen, those fans are worth a lot. There's a model called a thousand true fans and a true fan is somebody who'll spend $100 a year on you. If I have a thousand of those fans, a hundred thousand dollars in revenue. So it's really about building those names. So those 800 people that put up the 85,000, man, I would be, you know, oh, oh, I'd be like, you know, petting them because they, they're, they're emotionally bonded to that. And that's really the value. So even if your crowdfunding doesn't work, 
it doesn't matter. You can come back. Like the one he talked about was great. What was the guy that you said you were telling me about that made the device that, yeah, he, what was the story real quick? This is great. He, 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 uh, he, he did it. The first time he did it, he fell short of his campaign goal. Of about, it was, he was trying to raise a hundred thousand dollars, right? 125 and he got like 119. Did X, Y, and Z wrong and then came back and this past summer and raised 13 million. Raised 13 million. So remember that, so he was smart enough to like say, okay, I got this momentum. Then he wrote stories about why he didn't make it and whatever, all these things to try to get these people and build that rally cry. Because the game is this, <laughs> you have to build a rally cry, something people, to create a social movement, it's about creating something that's a rally, having an enemy, something that you're solving, something that you do. You figure that out, that's why people get behind it. So does your thing have a rally? Is it doing something of value, you know? Well, isn't there like usually a video associated? So it's either the person, the individual there talking to your audience saying, this is what I want to do, or it's a, a sizzle reel of some sort mm -hmm. or a combination of, of the two. So it really is, there's a script there. We did a combination. That, right. th what did you do? We So we... We started off with the filmmakers sitting around the table. It was the actual hikers. And they said, here we are. We're doing a Kickstarter campaign. And this is why we did the project. And this is what we were hoping to do with it. Here, we'll show you the, the clip. And then they showed the sizzle. And then afterwards, they said, this is what we're going to use the money for. We can use it for post-production, color correction, music, lawyers, you know. And then, uh, and then just ended it with, like, please help us if you can. And that video was shareable, right? And then REI picked it up. And they, you know, ran a campaign with How it. How long and, was the video? Under five minutes. Is there an optimal length? Two to three minutes max. So you, I mean, you can have exceptions, right. but generally speaking, if, if we're brought in, we do two, three minutes. Right. So let's, on that note, I, I want to dive a little bit deeper on on the preparation of campaigns. And you know, what are some things that, that the creator needs to keep in mind? <laughs> uh, video is one. Uh, crafting the story is a huge one. What are some other points that the creator needs to put in their their checklist in the weeks and months. Well, don't you campaign. also have to decide if you're going to do Kickstarter, Indiegogo, some of these, you know, you create your own site. Crowd tilt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There, there are, you can, there's a, uh, a number of different platforms for, I, I guess, I don't know how aware, but uh, you have to choose. Do you want to be Indiegogo? Do you want to, be on Kickstarter? Do you want to be sort of stand out on your own? Crowd Tilt is a new one that uh, you can basically own the domain and and market it as you will. So each of them have the pros and the cons, and and that making that decision is something that's there's roughly critical. around 450 different sites right now, at least that last lately. So there's a lot of people jumping into the crowdfunding area for sure. So I'll give you my two cents. The number one mistake, the number one mistake people always make with these campaigns is to set the target too high. So crowdfunding is about two things. It's about momentum and perception. That's it. And in that order, momentum first and then perception. So if we have a client that comes to us and says, hey, I've got a, a campaign that's easily good for $100,000. My first question is, great, where's the first 25 grand coming from? Because if you don't launch with 25 or 30% on day one, you're done. That's it. There's no saving that campaign. No amount of PR, social media marketing is going to do anything. And we get people come to us all the time. Hey, I'm, I'm kind of hovering at this, this you know, 20%. We can't help you. you got to relaunch. So the first thing you should consider is how valuable is your network. And that network is your friends, family, and fans. Yeah. And if you tell me they're good for 25 grand, I'm going to say, okay, they're good for about 10 or 12. So the truth is you have to figure out how to launch big. And then from there, once you know what your network is worth, then you can figure out the target. To us, everything else is secondary. I mean, press is important, blogs are important, social media marketing, but if you don't launch with momentum, that's the number one killer of these campaigns. Yeah. I can tell you, just with the artists and stuff that I work with, I tell them they don't start for six months, especially depending if they have a lot, if they already have a big base, mm -hmm. and like you said, they've got all this, that's one thing, but if you're starting, you know, you want to make sure you build up. I always kind of look at it like, it's like the, the days when we used to, you know, movies, making movies, the, the, the guys would do all these little independent films. They'd make the poster, they'd get the freaking, you know, treatment, they'd go get some actors tied to it and stuff, and then they'd go sell it to you, foreign rights and just get the money and then go make the film. It's kind of the same model as you, you want to think about building up your fan base, getting your story. You can launch six months of building your story up about getting ready to do this campaign to make it happen, make it go, but getting those buy-in because it's like every one of the ones that have failed is people that go into them without any momentum. 
it just it just dies because people don't just show up. You have to drive that traffic there. Would well, we did. That? We ran it a lot like a film production, right? We looked at it. We knew we wanted to do a 60 day campaign. So we laid out a spreadsheet like 60 days. And then Indiegogo has an amazing blog called Insights, I think Tips and Insights. And they have a statistician that's there and uh, analyzing all of the top campaigns. And he, he was like, okay, you have a hundred percent chance of winning, you know, or getting your money if you put a video every three days. We're like, okay, we need twenty videos dink, 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 every three days. Okay, if you thank your backers within the first twenty-four hours, you will get a hundred percent chance of reaching your goal. You know, there are these crazy things you need to treat it. So we're like, okay, we need somebody to be staffed on thank yous all the time. We need to have 20 videos. We need to have somebody doing at least three or four posts on Facebook a day that aren't about the campaign. We saw Facebook, like a news feed that was being sponsored by a movie, right? So we were putting posts on about like, what's the latest hiking boot? Have you seen that cool new trail? What is your favorite food on the trail? Just post us a picture of your last hike, you know? And then we'd be like, and by the way, there's a campaign going on. So we knew that we had all all of this content that we needed to generate and that we needed to reach out to bloggers, people that were the tastemakers for our niche audience. We identified who our niche audience was. We brainstormed 30 different, you know, people, but we were like, okay, we'll only address the top three. And we just laid it out all on a calendar. And then we prepared everything as much as we could, which I'm glad that we did because it was a job i was i was mentioning to darren it's like 24 you know 24 7. no that's only for one person it's for five people we had five people working full-time on the campaign it was non-stop it and, and and then one more thing just ad addressing the money we had family and friends come up and say we just want to give you money on the sly we don't want to have you to have to take the percentage out like, no, stand by we will use you we need to inf infuse your funds at a certain time we knew that the stats might be different now, but we had to reach 30% of our goal by the first quarter of our campaign. So we, on our calendar, we're like, these are the numbers that we want to reach. So if we didn't reach a number, by, because everybody wants to bet on a winning horse, right? You go and look at a campaign, they have only three days left and they've only reached like 10% of their goal. You're like, something must be wrong with it. And other people have figured it out. I'm not going to look at it and figure out what's wrong with it. So we would have friends and family standing by to keep us getting us over these these financial hurdles. So it, it always looked like something was happening, especially in that little dip in the slow part of the campaign in the middle. We kept putting. We sometimes put our own money in there because with San Facebook, who's going to take us over this thousand dollar mark or this ten thousand dollar mark? And nobody did. Well, we didn't want it to look like that. So we'd sometimes put in you know twenty forty bucks and we'd just you know give a thanks to our friends because you you have you, it has to smart. look like somebody's home but we laid it all out you guys are smart you're filmmakers you know how to do a schedule i think what was interesting what you said which is really that was really good i'm glad you said that uh the interesting thing is like they're not just talking putting my hand out please give me money please give me no, money I'm making, I think that's that. the wrong that's the wrong approach you're right by creating value in other ways what can you do that you can do to build that audience i think that you probably see that too is that work the same way Absolutely. as you guys yeah the uh, you know these campaigns just like everything else now uh, runs can run with analytics and analyzing conversion rates and all kinds of things that have nothing to do with selling the next great iPhone cover uh, and the thing that that you have to be prepared to do is to really embrace all of the pieces of the of the campaign not just your passionate part like for me. I just want to make a film. I just want to make a cartoon. I don't really want to be bothered with all these other things. But the reality is, is if you're going to do a crowdfunding, you are the filmmaker and the studio. And if you don't put butts in seats, it's not going to happen. So I'm not saying to the exclusion of any other component for it, but don't focus over focus on the parts that you love and assume that the rest of it will take care of itself. It's not if you build it, they will come. They won't find it. And so, you know, I was at a conference once where they did a little exercise and they, they, everybody was at tables and they gave us each $100. It was play money. And they said, put how much you want in marketing and put how much you want on production. And so it was a lot of producers. So, of course, we put 90% on production and 10% on marketing. And then they had the panel up there who were involved in marketing give all the reasons why you needed to do marketing. By the end of it, it was it was probably 
60 40 in favor of marketing and that's the one thing i mean i'm a producer so it comes naturally for me to produce but if you don't get people to come to your site you can't analyze the traffic and you can't convert them yeah i think one last thing i'd want to say about it too is you should know who your audience is because we're now in a world where you can find exactly your audience you can well, figure this out i mean there's all these new you have big big data there's ways to figure it out because if you're going to pitch you want to at least pitch to people that care about what you're doing well, that's the beauty of crowdfunding, right? Is, you know, everybody's complaining about the four quadrant movies and the blockbuster, you know, latest superhero movie and everybody's saying it's the death of filmmaking. Well, yeah, that's if you want to reach all these people. But I think the future of filmmaking is drilling in to your niche audience. I swear to God, there's going to be somebody out there that's making movies for dog lovers that love chocolate. Like, because there's people out there that do, right? Like there's this urban legend of this filmmaker that makes firefighter movies, right? So the narrative is about firefighters and he travels around the country. He makes one of these a year and he shows it just to firefighters and he nets a million a year. That's niche. So then you can truly find your passion and you can identify who the people are that also have that same passion because chances are there are other people like you and you can serve just that need, that market. You don't ever need to touch. And that's the emphasis of finding your audience, which is key, key, obviously. It's interesting. I always ask this question. How many people know who Joe Bonamassa is? Okay, two hands. <laughs> what if I told you he's a blues guitar player and he made more money than Katy Perry last year? $27 million, totally independent. You don't even know who he is, right? Right? He's big, big. That's big. So he's figured out. So this is like, a, this is the niche world right now. If you can become the authority in your niche, solve mm -hmm. problems for people, create a relationship, it's all about trust marketing. You got to build that trust. Once that trust is there, they're going to be happening. You know, so remember, it's how much you give. Remember, what's the story? A great marketing story. The guy that gave um, uh, came into the came into the meeting and said whatever, brought a latte for that first person, right? Then later in the end of the day, he said, "By the way, I've got this. I'm doing this cookie drive for my daughter. Would you guys mind?" Being? Instantly, the person writes out and gives them the money. It's just a psychological thing that goes on. So understanding the psycho psychology. Learn a little bit about growth hacking, concept of marketing and creative using data and analytics. Those can be your friends, A-B testing. All these things are really important, man. And you can learn all this stuff. I'm telling you, if you're not using Twitter, the greatest business tool on the entire planet, I swear to God, I learn more from that than anything. And on top of it, I spend my time. Like, I'm getting ready to launch a business. So what I did, the first thing I did was I said, who are the thought leaders, the people that would really help me in this business? I went out and I may have a list with these 10 people and I start working that group and now I'm become my relationship with these people is incredible. I would have never been able to see these people, but now I've got this thing. Now what happens is I'm helping them. We're doing things as I get ready to do my thing. I've already built that relationship because it's all about relationships, mm -hmm. right? That's the game. So let's, uh, I want to shift gears here in a second and invite some of our, our, our crowd funders up. But before we do that, uh, we talked a lot about, going after the audience and identifying the audience. What are some tactics, uh, you know, some straightforward tactics that uh, the audience can do, you know, starting right out of the gate, getting ready to launch their campaign. How can they, uh, how can they leverage that audience? What are some tools that they can use? I'm, I'm just curious how many people project is film related or television related and how many is like product related? So it's like film Cancer and TV, film. can you just raise your hand? And some kind of product? Because yeah. they're kind of different strategies, yep. different mm -hmm. ways of identifying your, your market. So let's talk to film, since that was the majority. Well, I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, someone once asked me, what is a network? And a network is just a, an aggregated group of eyeballs that all want to see the same sorts of programming. So I think that I think in one of the ways that they're similar is the internet is like the greatest aggregator of what I don't care what your interest is, uh, chocolate loving dog lovers or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, <laughs> so, Someone's I mean, do it. I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, I'm assuming because it's digital Hollywood, it's a pretty sophisticated group. But, you know, the, the, if you look at the uh, business model of an MCN, does everybody know an MCN? Yeah, that's probably. Um, so, uh, multi-channel network it's basically just you know aggregating smaller channels on YouTube to add up the subscriber base but the, the point is if you can if you can access all the different types of networks that are out there so blogs are networks MCNs are networks individual YouTube channels there's 
Twitter. There's Twitter groups. There's all kinds of new ways of where somebody's already done that first step of aggregation. So what you want to do is, you know, try to go to the highest, most relevant level where you're going to get the bit, the biggest uh, bang for your buck and tap into that, become important to them, become part of the conversation. And, and so when you analyze your, your, the data of traffic coming into your crowdfunding site, if you're able to do that, then you see where are you getting the big hits? Because if you get a thousand people from one site and you only get two from another, you know you're going to spend your time getting sites more like the one that has a thousand. Yeah. One of the tricks that's kind of interesting, which I'll throw out because I use this all, I talk about this all the time. I don't know how many people are out on Twitter and maybe you don't have too many followers. A tactic to use because the idea is you want to build enough followers around a specific set of keywords and things. So what might be, might be a way, most of you might already know, but the idea is, is like, okay, what is my story? Who am I? What am I about? What else is like me? Who else is like me? What else is, if they like this particular artist, would they like me? You can go in and do a technique that I use all the time to at least get the ball rolling is I have the artist go in and say, okay, what are you? It's blues. It's a guitar. These are my folks. I sound like this. And then we hashtag those people and we go in and then we make, we look at each one. We start following the followers of that. I have them follow 500 one time, wait three days. Everybody that doesn't follow, clean it out, start over because you'll usually get like 20, 25 to 30% of the people will follow you back. After a while, you'll get past this idea it, but it's at least you're starting to get into an area you're going to start listening because the thing about Twitter is about listening. Who's talking? Who's there? And you got, the goal is to find those people. If somebody shares something, like there's tools that you can find out, share some. If that person's sharing content 10 times, you want to reach out big time to that person and build those relationships. I believe that the most important thing is to build that first 100 people. First hundred people, man, focus on getting a solid hundred people that are like your, your total thing because they become your broadcast hour. Then it's all about creating content that will create a viral loop, something that you know that you can give out there to get these people to move it out. But really there's all these techniques. And like I said, you can find audience, like really tailor it, knock it and go right directly to those people. At the end of the day, when you were talking about the two different products, I agree the campaigns would be different, but it's the same thing. It's customers. I need to, ha oh, I want to own the customer and I want to build that relationship. I don't care what business you're in. All these same techniques and all this stuff is exactly the same. I'm working with a mortgage company right now that's building the whole set. I'm working with an art community. I'm working with artists and it use the exact strategies across all of it. It's the same thing. How do I build an audience of people that really care that'll be like super fans that will invest? So like anybody building these films, I would really think about, okay, what happens the day after the crowdfunding? That to me is the most important thing is how do I, what am I going to do? Because do I have more products coming on? Do I have add-ons? How do I, how do I interact with these people? That's the thing you want to build the most. Cause if it fails, so what? You can still take that audience and grow it. Right. Well, isn't that the advantage uh, or the, like the disadvantage of, of, of uh, Kickstarter is that you don't get the names of the people that have invested, you don't get no, the... No, you do get the names. You do? Because you, you have to fulfill the order. So you have their name and their address. Okay, so you get all the, the, the same statistics. But it's hard to carry them over to right. the next, your next phase generally. Because you can only message them through the platform. That's, right. That's why you need but, to drive them to that's your the, own... That's the advantage yes. of some of the other platforms where you have the more information. Yes. Um, I, I want to talk, just Bill made a good point, and Scott, I agree with you as well. Um, we believe in, you know, you guys probably heard this, influencer marketing. So in every campaign we do, one of the, the people we assign to the client is a blog outreach manager. And the purpose of this individual is to identify, target, and follow up with 300 blogs for every client. So if you're a filmmaker, and again, it doesn't matter, it could be a film, product, whatever, identify your niche audience, figure out, you know, have a virtual assistant, a team member, spend two weeks identifying 300 blogs that already have that audience. And then you got to Google their name and their email, and this takes some time. But you want to come up with your own proprietary list of bloggers. The best practice is then to contact these bloggers two weeks before you launch. By this time, you should have a fully baked soft launch page. The, the videos there, the rewards, the graphics are all done. You say, hey, I'm launching this campaign. This looks like it's right up your alley. Oh, by the way, if you cover it, we're going to give you a $250 perk. So we believe in incentivizing bloggers, right? It can't just be all about you and your campaign. It's what's in it for the blogger. And then, sure, you know, they got to write content. and That's a reward level of $250, <laughs> yeah, with not them, cash. The reward. So. <laughs> 
but it, it's really effective. Um, I mean, we did a campaign we just launched for a fashion entrepreneur for a high heel shoe. We got Daily Mail to cover the campaign, and we offered the blogger and all the bloggers a pair of three hundred dollars stilettos as a perk. And this one article got fifteen hundred shares, you know, over a hundred comments, and like fifty thousand views. It was huge. That one blog was better than you, anything you could get in like the LA Times or Variety. I mean, that's the fashion example. But I think finding the influencers, whether it's individuals on Twitter or it's bloggers that have that built-in audience, and then marketing to them once before you launch and once when you hit your goal is generally yeah. what's effective. But and it takes time. To add to that, what we did for our campaign as well is we identified who those were. We wouldn't have been able to serve 300. But the top ones we knew when we were putting together our calendar that we wanted to give some of them exclusive content. So thank God we had some editors on our team. So we put together special music videos that nobody else was going to get. We would give them exclusive interviews. We would give them behind the scenes stuff, special photos that was easy for us to create because we had all this content we, were going to use, we weren't going to use anyway. And then something that I would have done um, had I known about it at the time was create an affiliation. Um, we knew we were going to offer the film at some point on, on our website, streaming and download. Now you can create an affiliate code where you can have a widget up on a blogger's site once your film is launched, right? <clears throat> And anybody that clicks on that widget, there's a code that we know it goes to the blogger and you give them a percentage of all the traffic that they drive and all the, the revenue they generate. Well, if you bring them on, if they believe in you so much and you bring them on in the Kickstarter campaign, their, their take is maybe not 10% had they come on at the end, but it's 30%. So if you say, if you believe in us, all of, the, all of the traffic that you drive us later on when the film's available, we will give you a higher percentage. So it's just another way to leverage you because they, if you if you write a blog, like it's so hard sometimes to come up with content. You're like, oh, I've got to write again about something else. Like you make it easy for them, right? Just make it easy and give them something that's cool that their audience is already looking for. So I got one for you here. Here's an idea. I just have to think about it. Anybody heard of Fiverr? Yeah. yeah. Okay. How about bundling some five dollar product along with your product, like some cool thing? I mean, because there's some people that'll do some wacky stuff for five bucks. <laughs> Right, so you could make it really fun. Somebody could say, "Oh, he'll do or create a song for you or whatever." It'll be. You know, I like that. See, idea. I knew you yeah. would. I said I had one for you because that's a sweet bottle because it's five bucks. So twenty-five dollars, not the twenty dollars. Right? It's a great. It's a beautiful thing. So there's all kinds of things. Thinking about affiliates and also thinking about how you can hijack other traffic. That's always important is how you might be able to fit into something else, maybe tying a cause to what you're doing at the same time where you can build those relationships within that community, creating win-win. The goal is, is how do I create a win-win? Everybody wins. It's not just me getting the money, right. but what can I do for you? That's really cool. The WIFM is it. What's in it for me? Critical. Fiber. Like you're gonna or, or just you're get PewDiePie to uh, tweet your... Uh... <laughs> Uh, beautiful. Uh, so I want to switch gears here um, and invite our uh, one at a time. Invite our three pitchers to come up and talk through their upcoming crowdfunding uh, campaign, and then see what the panel's feedback is. And then if you have any questions for them or the panel, we can uh, turn this into a little bit more of an informal conversation as we go along. So first one up is John. Here he comes. Hi, John. Is that your real name? My real name is John. All right, John. Mm -hmm. um, I have, unlike my two counterparts who are going to meet shortly, I have not launched the Kickstarter campaign yet, or the crowdfunding campaign. I'm going to be launching it in March, but I've started to put the team together. I have a, a, a rough cut of our video as well as the supplementary video talking about trying to have videos come out every couple of days to keep okay. the momentum going. So for the when you see this, the first minute and a half is the beginning of our uh, our Kickstarter video, and then the last thirty seconds is um, an animation storyboard video that would show one scene in the movie, and I'm just showing you thirty seconds to so get a flavor of it. Um, but what we've tried to do is put together a team ahead enough, uh, you know, far enough ahead of time, so that we can start to build this momentum, Smart. and. Uh, so that we can uh, do the fundraiser and have a successful fundraiser in March and then shoot the film in June. How long is the campaign? The campaign we're going to do is a 30 day. And is it an all or nothing? We look like, it looks like we're going with Kickstarter, but we have not made that final decision yet. So it may be an all or nothing, yes. <laughs> all right, so let's play the video. Okay, let's roll it. Oh. 
Hi, I'm Tom Gould. And I'm John Serpy. And we're here in Los Feliz, an eclectic neighborhood in Los Angeles. Los Feliz is translated roughly as the Happies. And it's the setting of our feature film of the same name. We are so excited about this film. So excited. And we're asking you to help us make this life dream of ours happen. The Happies is about finding your true self. Whether you're a 21-year-old girl from the Midwest, or an actor on the cusp of stardom, or, or a 30-something recluse obsessed with tanning and red wine. It's funny, it's heartfelt, and it's incredibly moving. It's also got plenty of food trucks. Whether you're a full-fledged foodie or simply enjoy cooking, you'll be drawn into Tracy's story. Tracy's a small-town girl whose only goal in life is to get married and take care of her man. But when her actor boyfriend gets his big break, she moves out to LA to be with him, only to walk in on him having sex. With a man. Right. But rather than accept the truth of their situation, they both try to force the relationship to work. With less than ideal results. Right. We love these characters and the journeys they take. Their stories are unique, but their emotions are universal. We want to share this story with you, but in order to do that, we need your help. Let's hear from some of the amazing talent who've already committed to help bring this project to the big screen. Maybe you're thinking, who are these guys and what is their vision? Well, here's our vision for just one scene in the movie. Tracy is bored and isolated, wandering through the neighborhood streets, discovering what Los Feliz and L.A. are all about. The landlady has told her about Sebastian a recluse who lives nearby. Apparently, he never leaves his house except the suntan every afternoon. Although Tracy thinks it's a little weird that her landlady spies on her tenants, her curiosity finally gets the better of her. She sneaks behind his house and tries to hoist herself up to catch a glimpse of him. So that's just the beginning of that. But uh, at the end of the other video, um, at that point, we, we've we assembled a, a team of, all, you know, we have a photographer and we have a lot of crew already, so it's a, Reading quotes from them, trying to get more people involved and get people um, wanting to, to spread that word. And then one of our dilemmas has been we didn't want to really launch because we're, we're going for $125,000. And we did not want to launch without having at least a name actor or two because we thought that add a lot of value. And so that's why we've kind of been pushing it. And we also have casting directors. It's really hard to get anyone involved when we don't have funding. But just last week, we got um, Janine Garofalo to kind of be of our oh, nice. mm -hmm. So that was really exciting. We're hoping that that's going to start building some of the momentum leading up into March when we're going to launch the campaign. Let's first give this guy a round of applause. Come on now. Yeah. Nice work. Any questions, comments? How are you going to roll her in now with this video? With the video? Well, at that point in where, where we stopped it in the video before the animation video, it said, now let's hear from some of the people who are already committed and excited about the project. And so we do have like the cinematographer and our sound guy, you know, some of those people, and we're going to incorporate her in that a video of her in that. We have someone else who's, who's because the, the boyfriend of lead character is gay and hiding it. And but we have, uh, we also have a couple of actors who are kind of gay niche actors that are in some of those things that are going to be part of it as well to kind of draw some of that crowd into the race. Do you guys have any, any track record? Have you written, directed anything that's not, marketable? Not marketable. No, we've, uh, Tom and I wrote it together and we're directing it together and we've been writing for a long time. We've sold a couple of screenplays and we've had some TV show things option, but we've never had anything that got made. Right. And so it's just really, no, you're you're and that was part of the reason we decided that we're going to make this. Well, your play. person, your personalities are great. Uh, I, I would love to just know a little bit more about you sure. and your passion again for the, for the project of, of, you know, you wrote it together. You've, you know, you've, you've, Developed a couple of things. You've gotten yeah. close, but the industry itself, so and and this, you know. So we decided to take this path. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to say I'm going to agree with you because now the story. Think about it. Every time you watch American Idol or The Voice, what's the first thing they start with? Yeah. It's a story. They're right. trying to buy into that emotional side. They want to buy into your struggle. Remember the rally cry, man. I want this. I want these guys to make it happen. Right. That's what you're looking. For. For to make the first act, just yeah. like yeah, yeah, you don't get it. Your story that's what I was saying before is like your story is just two guys, two glib guys in LA trying to make a movie. Yeah. Not right. to be you know critical, but yeah. that's really and that, so then I'm thinking, okay, well, what is the movie they're going to make? And you don't even get into that until mm -hmm. I probably have already clicked past it. Also, how did you come up with the with the figure of 125,000? That seems 
quite high for an independent film. I mean, I know people who've made whole movies for a lot less than that. Uh, working with our producer, that was the number that we yeah. came up with. We wanted to raise somebody. So I think it's okay for you to have that goal to raise that 125, but I wouldn't set the target at 125. And this is, again, goes back to the common mistake. People think they have to set the target at what they need. Your goal is to create perception. Set it at 25 or 50 and try to blow it out of the water because, again, if you set it at 125, you will really have to launch with like 30, 40 grand in the first couple of days. Another comment, it's, so it's about a city, right, Los Feliz? I think we've seen challenges with hyper-local campaigns, so it's tough to rally that one city, right? And clearly there's that opportunity, but I would focus on kind of the broader themes, which clearly you have some universal themes, sexuality and food trucks, for instance. You come up with the reward, hey, you go out to 50 food trucks across the country, for $10,000, their food truck will be featured in your film. So figure out what's in it for those guys, and that's like a 10K reward. Yeah, we have been, we have been making relationships with different food trucks around the city, trying to awesome. get them so that they would be yeah, the other thing I would think about is I would try to figure out what problem you could solve with this. In other words, is there some moral of this story, something that would help people where you could create content that is coming out of the storyline that actually can be of value? Because that gives you something to then talk about that's not talking about my, uh, talking about my film all the time. Right. right? Gotta, I'm, it's something I'm helping people learn something. Like why about do we it. need to know your story? Why? Right. What will we have gained out of that? And I think you have to put your actress in the first 10 seconds. Five yeah. ten seconds. I think you need to move that up. I think your your beginning was too long to get to someplace. Yeah. You know, like the graphics are interesting right. and the signs, but it, it it doesn't mean you have a very short amount of time. And I have to say it, but I don't donate to campaigns where I can't. If it's a film, I want to see your filmmaking work. Like all I saw were your storyboards. You know, yeah. and that doesn't give me a vote of confidence. Uh, you know, if you think of me as as just an investor that's right. kind of tooling well, I'm around. But I, but but imagine like with our campaign, our video was picked up by REI. It, they just lifted it right off of Kickstarter and they put it right on their Facebook page. And they was like, "Hey, doesn't this look cool, guys? If we can get five thousand likes in twenty four hours, we're going to get donate five thousand dollars." And we got that in six hours. So. I know, but 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 I'm thinking like, can't you do something? One scene with your uh, with the actress and put that right up front, just like the shocking moment, and then you can be like. Oh my gosh, yeah. haven't you guys either had the fear of being with somebody that c could be closeted or something like it, and then you back us? I just had an idea for you. I liked his idea because the struggle, right? So it's like, damn, man, Hollywood sucks, right? Because that's your, that's your enemy, yeah. because they don't let it happen, right? right? Nobody seems to get behind, man, we've been fighting this thing, blah, blah, blah. And the next thing you know, you have your actress walk in, who's the name, says, dude, I'm behind you. Right. So it's in other words, you're talking about the struggle where you're trying to go, but now you're actually getting people's authorities attention. So if you sure. can bring those thought leaders, people in that can help give you the because, like you said, you don't have a big base of stuff. So the, right. the talent and and the rewards and then the, the what you can do to help people with it. What morals can you pull out of this is sure. help people in business and touch people. What is it going to do? Right? Or have her come in and say, my boy, I just found you my have, boyfriend in bed with a man. Question or a comment? Yeah. A question right out here. Yeah. So my, my, my comment and question was really about the fact that it seems that what we're really talking about is marketing. It's, what I didn't get is a sense from this piece that had any marketing focus. And, it, and I think, you know, Bill, you were talking about it. I know, Mike, you were talking about it. And, and also, Scott, the whole idea seems to be that you have various, your campaign is not just a campaign, it's parts of a campaign. You've got to understand that just to launch, you have to have a certain way of thinking and you got to be able to capture a certain type of attention. And I guess what I'm, I'm looking for in terms of what we saw with this is that this looks very typical to what you know you see. It's actually better than most in, in terms of the way it's shot. And at least you do have some relationship that's, that's there. But it doesn't seem to have any focus. Like, I don't know if I'm the right person for that campaign or the person sitting next to me or anybody in this room is because maybe it's really for a, you know, a specific kind of audience maybe it's for you know chocolate loving you know dog mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> well it, is it a, is it a campaign that is going to get supported by people who want to support struggling filmmakers or is it a right. campaign that's going to get supported by people who want to see that movie and then how do you identify those? Who are those top bloggers? Who are the 300 top bloggers that are interested in watching? Like, I think narratives are a lot harder. Docs are super easy or products are easier. Like niche, it's harder. So then do you, do you reach out to the people that are in support groups? For 
I agree with you. But then I don't get a sense of that in the story, you know, how foodie so, goes into the story. Yes, I think that needs to be well, what's, what's really important when you're going to pitch uh, a script or a movie is the theme, is what is, that, you know, in one sentence, what is your movie about? And if you can identify that, which you, you have to do, then I think you can focus um, the, the, the consumer's attention or your audience's attention on that theme and hopefully get them to relate to it, whatever that is, you know, fidelity, infidelity, um, stranger in a strange land, or whatever that that theme is for your, for your film. But I think you have to identify that first and then make sure that everything is driven toward that, that focus. And I have to say, this is what I love about crowdfunding, is it forces artists to think about as marketers. It forces them to think of audience. Who are these people? Where are they? What are my themes? It's almost forcing you to do like a business plan, and that's why I say you've got to do it, even if you don't need the money. Like exactly. it, it forces you to just think. Yeah, one of the things she said that I want to reiterate too, that really is important, is putting together a strategy. I mean, like a media calendar. You should be. I mean, you should think out like even beyond and after the campaign. It's like what's going to happen, so you know when is your content going out. Like every day, and people say, well, how often should something go out? I can tell you there are people that I follow that are killing it on the internet and they post every 15 minutes, 24 seven, and they've built their business. But what they do is everything they post has value. If it doesn't have value and it's slack, and the last thing you want to do is say, please give me money. Hey, I'm launching my Kickstarter campaign. And that's why tying it to other things to build the relationship is really critical. That's This is a relationship marketing model. And and I can scare you by saying we had we launched our or we finished our Kickstarter campaign one year before we launched the movie. So we had to speak to our audience for a whole year before we were actually ready to give them an action, like buy a ticket, vote, you know, review our film. So it, there there's a very long tail to it. And you have to know what you're what are you talking about? What are what are the other four posts in your Facebook ab about when it's not about your campaign? Is it about food trucks? Is it about, you know, closet gay people, whatever? We'll take one more question out here, and then we need to move on. What a nice exchange of information and ideas. This is wonderful. Sweet. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Right. <laughs> nice. I want what he's drinking. So. <laughs> there was a cash That's bar. the best question I've ever heard. Thank you very much. has been really great. I really appreciate all this. Thank you, John. Best Let's give him a round of applause. Best of luck. Next up is Lena. <laughs> I'm really nervous, so I'm going to record it so that I can remember what you guys say. <laughs> 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 We're sampling some of that outside after this panel, so. Samples afterwards, she's going to take her. Now you know why she can't remember what we're going to say. <laughs> she decides to sell it in the form of a fake pop song. And um, yeah, it's a look at our generation, social media, and everything that has to do with that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. So I smoke a little pot with my friends. But I've done everything you're supposed to do. Real shape when the sun goes down. Resumes, LinkedIn, Monster.com. Alta Vista cards. Dude, are you listening? Your mom, she just messaged me. Oh, and she just shared an article entitled, even though you're in your 20s, it's not okay to still be living at home. Wow, that's incredibly embarrassing. Dude, that's so embarrassing. Wow, she also updated her status. A mother knows she raised her daughter well when she can see success in her daughter's eyes. How do you, how do you see success in eyes? I can be a successful person. I have many successful attributes. I do, I have so many. I can't think of one successful attribute. I'm a baby joint. I'm just a baby joint. Put me in your mouth and smoke me.
I want you to suck on my cake pop. Want a cake pop? Uh, put it in your mouth. Well, if I want it in my mouth, I'll put it in my mouth. Don't dick smack me. Shit. These are my cake pops. Hey, Kai. I totally had a dream we were doing this, except we were naked. Mm. And then we did a tribal dance. <laughs> Grace, listen to me. Listen, I love you. I have always loved you. But you can't keep on doing this. Get off the damn couch. The answer is right in front of you. Grace, the hardest thing in this world is to live in it. Be brave. Live. For me. Yes. Guys, this is it. This is it. We sell the cake pops, but with weed in them. I knew a guy once who did that. No, no. We're selling cake pot pops. Wow. Sweet. And I know the perfect place for our new business. Paper trails. All right. So tell us a little bit more about the campaign, the length. And the so the campaign, we did it, we're doing it on Indiegogo again. We started it and I think what I've learned is that we started it without, we built a, we built a Twitter audience, which is great. We needed to build more of an audience and we've done well. It's hard to, I don't know how to explain it other than like, it's so hard to do it all on your own. And I have a partner and she's great, but even with a partner, it's like you want an army to promote and you need an army to promote and to raise that even 20,000 it's excuse my language it's fucking hard so what what percent of your efforts are going towards the marketing part of the equation versus the production creative part um right now i'm spending all of my time doing that we did promo picks which have actually been really helpful i think in the sense of like people want to click on a link and just see a picture and kind of see what it's about of the picture so we did these like really artsy we've got andy's got one these artsy pictures it's like me putting on makeup with a joint it's i mean things like that and then we're just putting them out and seeing, <clears throat> seeing how we go from there instagram we're using all of our like social i think media. that that's you know my experience too because you're in a place where there's no need for anybody to you're not you know until until you get to enough exposure you're not going to even if you have the greatest things in sliced bread, it doesn't matter. So that's just go into it knowing that you're going to spend most of your effort and time and energy on the marketing part of the equation. And, uh, and then, you know, you make the film or you do the other part in your spare time. Yeah, does, question. Does, uh, does the campaign on Indiegogo, I can't see you because you're behind here. Uh, does it make it clear that this is a series and yeah. this is the pilot and yeah. that's that's like written yeah. before they view the video? Yeah. So it's yeah. in it's, context of some that, sort. Are you thinking too, who's your audience? Is it the pro-pot people or is it the anti-pot people that might say, look at what happens to society? I mean, you know, there's a definite balance there, right? Really old people. <laughs> yeah. Like my parents, their age group, they were really enjoying it. And I wasn't expecting that. 
is there a moral to the story? I mean, as far as, you know, is it, is it just kind of, okay, free foam pot is really good yeah, or it's yeah, whatever. No. Or is it like, Hey, this is, you know, you gotta be careful. I mean, what is, cause that can help you determine where you want to go yeah, with it. Exactly, yeah. Pro pot and anti pot. So it's yeah. longer. We, did we just stop? And yeah, it's, it's this is, this it's, is. So our pilot was actually nine minutes, which is pretty long for a web series. Um, from what I've heard. So can I just ask where the pilot goes and where it ends just real quick? Yeah, the pilot goes to her deciding to use her best friend's place as the, the business center. Um, she has a rich best friend, <clears throat> so she uses her as her means. Um, she uses her best friend's credit card. They buy all the hydroponics and all the supplies and then wake up the next morning after they run this <coughs> huge fundraiser, which is just really a party. Um, Pot the, party. Yeah, to the realization that they owe six thousand dollars on a credit card. So it starts from there, and the plan is for the eight episodes to take it. Um, well, our our plan is to kind of take it into a Breaking Bad sense, which is like we want to get rid of the, the storefront and <clears throat> use a place where we can like we want to film in different areas. So if they're making the pig pop pops in a van, then they can go to different Anywhere. areas. And food truck hot so do you know what your conversion rate is like the peep the so for every person you come get to come to your campaign and sees your campaign what percent of those people donate and at what level I don't know that. is it launched this in the new indiegogo campaign right now, yeah. the first and one, how much you time do you have much on the first one um I've, i think we've raised i think it's 1800 right now how much more time Okay, so first I totally dig it. I mean, I feel like I'm in that video like a long time ago. I'm like, what the fuck do I do? You know, <laughs> I can relate. But I think, you know, you've got two people. So your biggest challenge is you've got a limited resource, which is your time. And there's so many things to do. Like, is it the bloggers, social media marketing? What I would do is I would spend time trying to identify and target two, three, four strategic partners. So like high times, for instance, right? Yeah. Hey, look, we've got this great modern, you know, pro pot comedy. We think you guys would love it. I would spend a lot of time in a few really high value targets. I don't think you're going to blow this thing up on social media in 30 days. It's so hard even to do that for people with names and brands behind them. So I would spend a lot of time on really high value targets where if you get through to just one of them, like High Times pushes this out on Facebook or Twitter, right. that's that influencer marketing approach. And, We're trying high times you know, right now. Do you have any other ones for us? <clears throat> Colorado. That's great. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> I have a I have a dealer named Jay and he's got Jimmy Yeah. I think you need to target all of those guys that are having that have the collectives. They got mounds of cash in bags. Well, I, I actually just launched something called Weed TV. Really? Yeah. So Yeah. Dot com, weedtv.com. So I but do there's, have a there's magazines. I'm sorry. There's there's all kinds of magazines, and but I think it's moving. You got to move up the food chain because yeah. if you're already launched and you only have 1,800, <laughs> <laughs> the edible food chain. He said. <laughs> well, that 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 was the other thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think she's sale. found her but audience. That, but that sale. There you go. Bakes. <laughs> They're all right here. I don't have a bake sale. <laughs> That's what you do. You drive up to their house but, and you do a bake sale right this, at their house. This is this is like out of context. <laughs> <laughs> do you have the pops with you? <laughs> so so what I've seen so far is is it's out of context with this social movement that's happening with in Colorado and Washington, the legalization, edibles, big business, making a lot of money. I don't know if it goes there, but to put it in context more in today's very relevant world where these girls are saying this huge business look at this edible companies are making a fortune right. you know we can we sell to dispensaries can we distribute can we you know do we need licenses uh, no well okay then we have to an underground to which goes right. to right so all i'm all i'm saying is is to really put it within a social context of what's happening in the world today with legalized 
you know, marijuana, medical marijuana, um, the issues of people with edibles eating too much and not getting the right dosage. How much do we put in? You know, do we put in a little? So it's do we put in <laughs> too much and people is... go crazy? <laughs> I, no, I, I'm saying no. There's a lot. There's 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 <laughs> tremendous places to go for your series. And I, I want to. But I think on, I just want to make sure that's set up in your pilot. I, again, I I mean I I I'm, I'm more interested in the story and the creative content, but that's not going to help you. Um, but I think. You got to you got to keep your eye on the ball, which is getting people to come to the campaign. Because without that, you're not yeah. gonna you're not gonna have a successful so, campaign. Uh, There's there are um, big conventions for weed, so yes, you know get in the car the just, and go from convention to convention and URL. take your postcards. Yeah. You got to you got to focus on those high targets. My, my real quick no, thought to Bill's point, I think you have to go. You nice. got to aim aim for the <laughs> the ceiling, and you got to go to the biggest groups out there. And again, pick two or three maybe. I would use LinkedIn. I'm a big believer in the concept of social selling. It's how you use LinkedIn social media to bring in business. It's not about cold calling. You can find the right person now on LinkedIn. I heard you mention LinkedIn in that video, which is great. Hit these people up on LinkedIn. Send them an email. Hit them up on Twitter. Follow up by voicemail. Send an email. Get the right person from high times in a call. Go to the editor and start at the top. Go to the CEO. You'd be surprised. A lot of people rule out these big companies. They're like, oh, it's impossible. How would I get to high times? Like, why would they care? And then suddenly the CEO at high times is like, holy shit, this is awesome. Like, we got to get this thing out there. So I would aim big. What, what, all, so, my, but I'm. So I am confused, last, though. Last Good job. Right here. Last comment. If she fails, it's probably because she hasn't gotten to enough people. So therefore, and I would defer to Darren, but you know, failing is the best way to succeed. So you fail, just repackage it, take your lessons, and you know, in the uh, video game business, we're launching we're launching an app, and uh, and one of the video game marketing companies said, what we do is we do the A B page where we, we launch a piece of artwork next to it uh, about the video game. And if somebody clicks on it, that means that they wanted to play the game. Well, there's no game because they're just working off of the idea of what does it take to get a conversion? And they said, but you know what? It's, it's so we get a thousand people pissed off. Who cares? That's not going to be our number. Anyhow, we need a million people. So the same thing is if you fail, so what just repackage, learn and move up the yeah all, all i was trying to say is that to be to be relevant is that no one else is, can make this show no network's going to put it on no you know so, so you know yeah we could do it but but, <laughs> but, what, but what i'm saying what i'm you know you know what i'm saying i'm saying that to again to play the anti um Lena, you know, take that position i'm i'm a little confused and concerned is this the video that's on your indiegogo page uh right now it is out pitches for the like every like two to three days we put out video pitches that are just kind of like little sketches that me and my writing partner do just to keep people especially just to keep our facebook people interested because most okay. of my facebook friends and family okay so consider that friend of mine colorado my home state sends this says <laughs> oh do you, they just put a link on my my page hey check this out i start watching this video i don't know what i'm watching first of all it's really long you're giving me the whole backstory and there's no call to action i have no idea that it's part of a campaign i don't know that it's this is a pilot for something that's bigger that could be cooler that i could help get out to the world you have to think like a commercial. Do you know what I'm saying? And and and, and, and maybe it's yeah. not. I, I think I a do pitch like for the your four, campaign. I, do, I like the structure that we did with ours, and it seems to work when I'm looking to donate too. It's like, who are you? Give me a piece of it. Show me what you can do. Your talent is, and then you've got to give me a call to action at the end. What is the 800 number that I'm calling? Our operator standing by. What are, do you know what I'm saying? Like you have to give me a reason to. Like I, I love this. This was funny, but I didn't know 
what I'm watching. So, and it has to be something that's shareable. Like if I'm just nobody and I stumbled on it, I know exactly what I'm watching. I get it. You got somebody over here. Okay, that, that's the last one. Then we're moving on. Yep. Uh. Kia. Kia. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. Kia is saying is that what's called the save some money with what you have right now, you know, Groucho Marx just walk up and do an aside to the camera and talk about what's going on. Right. I think what you could do in, in essence is take what you have already and stop the action, go and do an aside of saying you know, call to action what you want, go back to the trailer and manipulate that to save a lot of money. Mm -hmm. right. And you know what? If it doesn't succeed the first time, I'm here to support. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys. Yep. All right. Thank you, Lee. And Andy. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea that that was her pitch for the world. That was the bot. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, right up until they start saying. All right, sounds good. Hi, my name is Andy Alt. We're sitting here in Echo Park, California, somewhere between Hollywood and downtown LA. And this morning it's rather quiet. I think we're looking to change that. I've created and patented a revolutionary new electric guitar pickup that allows guitar players to play guitar and bass simultaneously or separately. Let me show you what I mean. One day I was jamming with a drummer and I was looking for a way to bring some bottom end to the room. No, not that bottom end. <laughs> I was looking to fill out the sound a little bit and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was a bass incorporated into my guitar? And that's how A Little Thunder was born. It takes your bottom strings on your guitar and converts them to be bass strings. This is designed to be a standard replacement for your humbucker. There's no routing required, there's no 9 volt battery to change. Uh, no MIDI, no extra strings to get these sounds. You just simply replace the humbucker with about five minutes of installation time and you're up and running. So let's check out what guitarists are doing with a little thunder. Flip that switch up. Now flip that switch. Cool. All right. fatter sound out of this guitar and I wasn't cutting it so I went home and I played around with some DSP technologies on a small computer board I wound up working out a way to synthesize different you know sounds from a string and I looked it up and really nothing like that had been done previously especially anything baked onto the guitar so I applied for a patent and after some you know research and go back and forth to the uh, patent office it got granted and uh, August of this past year. So I started doing uh, research and development. I hired an engineering team and uh, we made a lot of progress. And so now we just we just launched this Kickstarter about, well, I guess, yeah, 11, 12 days ago. We never had done a crowdfunding effort before. Met Taylor over the summer and they were like, told him my idea and he said, you know, you really should try it. You know, do a Kickstarter, do a crowdfunding campaign, I bet it would go really well. My background is in marketing. I also work for Steve Roddy, who's a guitar player. And um, 
I'm a copywriter as well. So just thought, yeah, yeah, I think I think crowdfunding is the way to do it. We'll gauge responses. We'll see how it goes. Um, and so yeah, a couple of days in, we've we've gotten some really great press hits. You know, if you scroll down just a tiny bit, so far it's been picked up by these um, media outlets. Uh, we were on Guitar World first day. Uh, Keys Mag, I heard guitar, guitar noise music radar. There was an AMA on Reddit happening before I even got there. It was like pretty cool stuff. So yeah, this is a, a really fun effort. Brand new to this, completely brand new. So under two weeks, we've uh, we're at about seventy percent of our goal so far, and uh, I own one hundred percent of it. And I'm just trying to make it the best product it can be. And I think the right way to do that is through community. So. That's, uh, I would certainly uh, include the fact that you've got a patent on it. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of mentioned it in the beginning, but I also don't want it to be too heady because you know guitar players were. Well, no, because yeah, because that that just me, me, means it's so much more proprietary to you. Yeah, exactly. And it's not just something that anybody can. They come can't just go to do. the store yeah, and just grab it. it. So they're investing in something that can be a lot bigger. Yeah. You know, not just this one little thing that you have, and then some big you know fender comes along and they. Right they, right, they do it and blow you out of the water. Exactly, yeah. So well, I think that was my thinking. It was just to secure, I had the idea two and a half years ago, it was just really to secure that that piece of the puzzle to make sure that we really couldn't get ripped off. To, at least as easy yeah, as but I think that, that that's you need to mention that I would it. like to know. I, I'd be. So Taylor, can you scroll up to the top for a sec? So Andy, this is awesome. Um, yeah. I don't play guitar, I'm a piano player, but congrats on the campaign, the momentum. I'll tell you how you can fund this thing without any further marketing to an outside audience. So, you know, the client it's the concept that your best clients come from existing clients, right? You've got 134 backers and you've got three updates. If you were to just do a daily update yep. for the next 18 days, you're funded. So you should be thinking about your stretch goals. Hey, once you hit 35 grand, what are you going to give people when you raise a hundred and a yep. new slew yeah. of rewards, right? So this thing's yep. going to be successful. And you got to do the updates. So statistics show that the more updates you do, the more money you raise. I mean, this is a fact. It's not an opinion. You guys should strive to do an update in these campaigns once every two days. Sometimes it's, you know, hey, thank you guys. Sometimes it's a picture. Sometimes it's share this. Other times it's, hey, we got written up in Guitar World. Sing a song. Sing a song, you yeah, know, content. People. But those 134 people, you could double the size of your backers just through those updates. So I would be doing updates every day and coming up with a content schedule for the next 18 days. Yeah, Are you thanking? Outside of Guitar Center or something. You know, where you're interviewing people and showing them, hey, what do you think? Wow, that's amazing. Are you thanking every one of your backers? Yeah, as soon as they come in. Because, yeah, like I think, I can't remember what our numbers are, but like 70% of people that backed us increased their money. So you expect for people to increase it because they want they want to see you win. So it's like engaging them and especially saying like something special is happening, but only for the backers. So if you want to yeah. see this special thing, you've got to donate money. I would even, not donate. But. I would even add that you should be trying to get back to them as quick as possible. Like yes. if somebody posts like that guy that put up the buck, and you need to hit him like right. I mean, right. you should be like watching that because there's a thing about how much time goes in right. between. Right. If you really show that that you know you're there right away, people yeah. want to know that you're behind what's happening. It's like same with the social. And stuff. at the end of every day on Facebook, would say thank you to all our backers, and we would list them. And sometimes we would do a video where we would like say their name, mention them on Twitter, and thanks five people at times. Yeah. So the rewards range for a dollar, you get a download of the first recording of Little Thunder that I'm going to be recording. Soon. Go. Are they? Is, oh, it's a download. It's a download, yeah. Okay. So um, they get that for a buck. For twenty-five, they get you know a, a special mention on the website plus a pass to our party at NAM, which is like a big musical before I can mention thing. And then starting at two hundred dollars, they get uh, the pickup for a twenty percent discount for when we'll be in retail outlets in twenty fifteen. Then I've got for two seventy-five a limited edition painted one by this really cool graffiti artist. Three hundred bucks uh, lunch with Frank Zappa's tech. <laughs> uh, nice experience. Wait, it gets weirder. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, then I had you know orders for two or more or whatever. So now I got into guitar lessons. So for four hundred dollars, you can get a guitar lesson with uh, this guy named Pete Thorne, who plays with Chris Cornell, Mark Morris, at Bridge, Don Hanley, all these people. Also, Gretchen Mann, who's in this all girl Led Zeppelin tribute that really, really likes. Um, Rihanna's guitar players in there. Uh, really good jazz players in there, and then scroll down just a little bit more. And so, 
for three thousand dollars you can spend the day at disneyland uh with drake bell and i and then we're gonna be drake and josh i played in front of his band so we're gonna take some some we only got one person out of two so far going to disneyland and then just a couple of different different things we'll take we we're offering the ability if someone wants to buy a guitar at guitar center we'll go to the store buy the guitar and install the pickup and ship it to them for you know very marginal cost over what the actual guitar costs. So it's kind of like if you have an eye on the Fender Stratocaster or something, we'll buy that guitar, put this in it, and only charge you a small portion of what it actually costs. So just to get get the thing out there, Steve buy all the the guitar, and then for ten thousand dollars you can buy fifty pickups, so the guitar builder can buy fifty pickups. What so, is the what's the thirty five thousand for? It's to go into manufacturing. So whenever you you know every person who bids on the unit itself. Um, I got really lucky actually with the R&D team. They introduced me to a manufacturer who had done a lot of work before. And they're like, oh yeah, we recently did a Kickstarter. Here, look at this. And I was holding the Oculus Rift prototype. So I was like, <laughs> well, yeah, this is right. <laughs> so so I've got a lot of confidence in the team and getting this shipped out. We're, we're aiming to ship more. Do you make, you, do you do let people know that? Yeah, because no, you want there's certain things that people know, and I'm kind of saving little goodies for along the way. Maybe I'm not timing them quite right, but we have released a lot of supplementary content, like demo stuff with different artists. And there's a whole slew of artists. I had tons of different artists come to my apartment, my little apartment at Echo Park. So everyone from social distortion guys, just like Dweeble Zappa, the Mahavas, just the tactical like 20 artists. Is there you, something you wish you would have done that you didn't do? Um, well. So far, I don't think we've made any uh, mistakes, but yeah, I think probably prepping for this mentally, because it really is a 24-7 job. Like, I'll go to sleep and I'll, I'll keep my phone on and I'll hear a ding, and it's, you know, it's a comment on Facebook. What we're doing is we're taking the press stories that we're getting, posting them on Facebook, and then um, putting like 50 to to $100 behind each story and promoting the post to different you know, uh, men and women, 1845, who like Guitar Player Magazine, this pickup company, that pickup company, this guitar company. And is that converting? And it actually is really good. I'm nice. Yeah. So um, it pays for itself every time for sure. Yeah. And, but, it's, you know, we're learning as we go. So it depends on the content, the artist. Yesterday we had this guy, Jason Becker, who uh, mm -hmm. is a real virtuoso, but unfortunately got diagnosed with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease Oof. early in his career. But he's out of the doctor's expectation by 25 years. Anyway, you know, he's got a Facebook fan page with 250,000 people. He shared it. Drake Bell put it up. He's got a seven and a half million person Facebook page. But it's not just about the volume we're learning. So, you're always recording this stuff. But, so, you know, Drake has a lot of fans, but like they're young teens. So they're not, they're not buying pickups. They're, you know, they're not, they're not doing it. So, I um, want to kind of go back and add a few prizes that they can get in on all these. You know, Could you custom uh, engrave those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's even like the first serial numbers that are up there. Right, right on. So, yeah, that's smart. Yeah, yeah. So painting them and engraving them. Doing kind of you should also think about, you know, again, with the updates, your backers, because that's your base. You've got yeah. this thing, you know, 70% funded. Yeah. You should do exclusives. Hey, you know, for the next two days, if you double your, your, uh, backing whatever you know from 200 to 400 yeah. we'll give you one not at 20 percent off at 40 percent off okay. people will double down because they're they're yeah. invested they believe in this they want one they probably want more so going back to those backers and saying hey for a limited time if you double down uh on your contribution we're gonna give you x or y and i would just so. really use the narrative of this doesn't fund it's not happening right. these won't go on the market the patent's going to sit there i don't know what i'm going to do next okay. like it's just it, it's a call to action, right? Then, like your PDS station won't be here anymore. Right? Think about in success, right? So when you hit, you're going to hit your number, right? What are you going to announce when you hit that number? You got to have new graphics, new rewards, and this has to be like instantaneous. So boom, you hit 35 grand. Hey, great. We're announcing a $50,000 and $100,000 stretch goal. You send that announcement to the backers. So don't let the idea of success catch you off guard because sometimes these campaigns you know, for the very few, that becomes the issue is they weren't prepared right. for the success. So. Yeah. Yeah, be, so you could also too, just what he was saying, if you get that stretch goal and you're going to try to raise a hundred, you could be giving, you, at that point you can give some product away, right? For say, nothing, if, right? Everybody back, everybody back at this point, what if we reach a hundred thousand dollars, they get their content? See, see, that's a, that's a, I think that's awesome. That's yeah. a smart, you think that works? oh, definitely. That's a smart, can you give away stuff for free? 
No, you, can give, you can give your product. Charity. Charity. I don't know. Check the rules on that. Yeah. There's a bit of an issue. You might have One a problem with people who are in after 35 being resentful. But yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed your video is 10 minutes. Yeah, it's a long video. That's very hard to share. You might want to consider doing a shorter version where you just like you share and you give us the nitty gritty, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it is a patent, you know, I need your help. Let's get this going. And, and, and your call to action, right? Like get there a, a little. Are you using quick? No, oh, sorry. I was actually going to say, it's, it's interesting you say that because I also agree. I thought my attention span is that of a nap. Like I watch something for two seconds, I'm either in or out or on the next page. But something about guitar players, they like minutia, they like details. So I was looking at um, the stats. So it's had 45,000 video plays so far. Wow. And uh, I don't even know how to compare it. I don't know. But 75% um, people make it to the end. So for me, that's that's, okay. that's impressive that for a impressive. ten minute video. Yeah. 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 Have you are you using Instagram at all? Yeah, we're doing some Instagram stuff, but we're doing videos. Uh, See, what I would do is you've got all these these great guitar players, right? That's a really nice little fifteen second clip. Right, you yeah. can put all those guitar yeah. players because now you're getting that authority, you're getting that endorsement. An endorsement, to, yeah. The endorsement, and you throw that on the page itself, right? I mean, we've right. seen campaigns where it's 100% endorsements. You can barely figure out what they're selling, and you've got these different A, B, C list celebrities. 15 seconds, 20 seconds, cell phone videos. It doesn't have to be fancy. No. But you've got this network, right? So I would go beyond just hey, having Drake Bell put it on Facebook and get you all those likes, I would have him do a video and then throw it up there and that makes it more. And that's shareable, yeah. right? But just make sure you're kind of like tagging it with like a logo or, you know, a yeah. something, you know, your URL. It's got to be driving somebody back. to a landing page or something. It's yeah, got a question it's back here. It's got to trace it back to you. Okay, so, so first of all, congratulations on the musician. It's awesome. Thing back. And I dealt with the USPTO getting a patent is no small accomplishment. Big time. That's a big deal. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Did you contribute? Uh, <laughs> I'm curious about the levels and what is effective because it goes straight from 25 to 199. Yep. Yeah. In my mind, you're missing a big sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Like 100 bucks is a mental <laughs> point for a lot yeah. of people. Even 75. I want to give more than 25 bucks, but I don't feel like I have to reward. I don't want to give Go to Fiverr. Get some t shirts made. Exactly. <laughs> what I was thinking was, I, I know my own bandwidth in terms of how, how I can. Ship a t shirt to the post office and order the t shirt and all that stuff. And I want to be able to give people something of value, but I also feel like if you've got to go down the page 15 items to find the actual product, to me that was complicated. And uh, I just thought, friends, you know, curious people are going to spend a dollar and they're going to get the song, and that's that. And then, you know, quite frankly, they can change it a bit after they get the song, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. Um, is, there, is there a point? Do you guys find a sweet spot? Yeah, you're leaving money on the table yeah. for yeah. sure. Yeah, okay. You can make up a digital item, something that's okay. deliverable digitally. You know, there was a, uh, a movie about uh, schools, and they just made a, a diploma with a blank, okay. you know, and then they just filled in people's names and just made a PDF, <laughs> and they sent it to people, and people got excited. Okay. People I mean, got excited. You, you have, like, the digital, you know, you're in the digital domain there, so the fact that you would leave money on the table for the sake of your own convenience in terms yeah, of so fulfillment, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, <laughs> if you were an employee, I think you'd have a lot money. of people here that wanted to uh, write you up for that. $25 is the sweet spot in these campaigns. So whatever it is that you're you know, raising money for, a film or product, your $25 reward should be incredible. It should have great value. So, so here's the big question. Can we get a demo? Yeah, I actually brought the guitar if you guys want to hear it. Good job. I, I got to say one thing that's, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier that the key is, is where are you going to go with this campaign, right? What are the products? What are the things? Because this is kind of you're getting into the market. But I would say what you've already done is the fact is you're the kind of an entrepreneur that I know that I would think about investing in because you're doing all the right things and you're putting the pieces together. And that's critical because out of this, that's the goal, right? You want to build your business. Yeah. This is one product. Where does it go next? How are you going to go? So how I'm are you also curious to make it happen, you know? why, why you chose a little thunder instead of just thunder? Yeah, um, well, it's a, it's a very convenient thing. It just adds this bottom end to it. And it sounds kind of weird, but my, my last name is Alt. And 
And as I was looking at it, I was like, oh, oh little old, yeah, I guess that kind of works. Like, in the well, <laughs> Oprah, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey. Oh, this Oprah. panel's about to get out of control. <laughs> All right, let's do this. with an off and then with an on. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. How about, how about you make one, make another version of it for bass guitar players so they could have a lead <laughs> instrument that's playing actually, along? That's actually, a, that's actually a really good idea, actually. That's actually a really good That's a good idea. Anybody <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm going to make a little plug here. Uh, this is not for crowdfunding, but uh, my son uh, on Friday night is on Shark Tank. That's awesome. And he started an alcoholic beverage company called Beatbox Beverages. And they taped it already in June, so I already know what happens. But I will say he makes a deal, and it's pretty spectacular. So for all of us entrepreneurs... Check it out, Brad okay, Schultz right. and Beatbox Brad on Schultz. Friday. Nice, Friday dude. Night. Come on. Friday night. All right. <laughs> nice. That's great. Well done. Good. Good luck on the campaign. So, any, uh, it's tough to top that, but if there are any final general <laughs> questions, uh, yes. Yeah, this goes beyond the crowdfunding yeah. kind of thing. It's anything else? Yeah. <laughs> um, recommendations for crowdfunding books, uh, how tos. I suggest to start looking at Google. winning campaigns. <laughs> Just start analyzing and breaking them down, seeing what they do, go to their Facebook page, go to their Twitter account. You know, if because I've been talking about my campaign, you might want to check it out and just see what we did. And it's a mile, mile and a half. It's a hiking joke. How much farther to the top of Mount Whitney? Mile, mile and a half. This isn't for a crowdfunding book, but a really good marketing book, which is, I think what we all agree is half the battle here, is called Contagion. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you read a book called Contagion, it's really... Got some really very practical uh, tips and lessons. It's not about Ebola. <laughs> no. 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 Uh, real quick, we've got, um, we have a campaign manager named Lee Andrews. He's written two really good PDFs. One of them is called the crowdfunding formula. The other is called the crowdfunding checklist. If anybody's interested, they're about 10, 15 pages each. You can email me. It's dmarble at filmbreak.com or come up and get my card and I can uh, email you those two PDFs. Another, um, actually, just to add on top of that, another one of Film Break's um, project managers is um, the author of Kickstarter for Dummies. 
which is another great read on crowdfunding. Yeah, question. Yeah, um, this question is for Bill and Michael. I mean, of all the user-generated people and people doing stuff on YouTube probably want to be in your position. So my question is why two producers who created and produced two of the arguably biggest shows ever are, are doing this versus traditional routes uh, well, I can tell you, uh, I uh, actually did pitch my series to some of the usual suspects, and it didn't fit their their mold for, you know, they have very specific needs in terms of who they want to program to, and they all were really nice, and my, uh, the creator of Jimmy Stones is uh, Jim, Jim Manos, who uh, got an Emmy for the college episode of The Sopranos, and wrote the pilot and created Dexter, the Showtime series, and worked on The Shield for a year or two. Uh, so he's, you know, he's a serious dude, and uh, but we just didn't fit in the slot, so we kind of targeted this and knew we were going to do this anyhow. Maybe we put less into our pitch, but really it's just a question of getting, getting the funding to make the show. Yeah. Do you know the song, There's No Business Like Show Business? Yeah. Well, one of the lyrics is, where else can you get money that you don't give back? You know, so, um, you know, but but it's it's not just that. It's not about the money. It's really about engaging an audience mm -hmm. and the direct relationship between between you and, and and the audience and getting them. Each person that donates isn't just them that will see the finished product. They're going to tell all their friends. So you know, it, it, it it's it's uh, geometric in the way that it grows, um, and it's just exciting. It's it's just new and interesting and and you don't have to deal with the conglomerates as much i just had a project a movie i just finished uh producing uh, uh called killing hasselhoff it stars ken jong right it's, it's, there you go. it's a celebrity death pool and ken jong bet the hasselhoff is going to be the first one who dies and he needs money desperately so he figures the only way he can do it is to kill hasselhoff before any of the other celebrities die and unfortunately, what happened is I wanted to do this as a Kickstarter campaign, uh, as a, not a Kickstarter, but a, a crowdfunding campaign and work with these guys. Unfortunately, the production company uh, that, that, that put up the, the, the money that, that was, we were working with was getting money from Dubai. And they wanted that money from Dubai to create that relationship so they wouldn't let us do this kickstarting, uh, kick, uh, crowdfunding. Uh, and I know, you know, with Hasselhoff, we could have raised millions of dollars, especially internationally. So it was really frustrating. So I'm just looking for the next project to uh, to do with crowdfunding, so that we can really control more of it, own more of it. Um, I I brought in on Baywatch. I brought in a little distribution company to distribute it when no everybody passed. Everyone passed when we bought the rights back. My partner and I bought the rights. It was on NBC, canceled after one year, and then my partner and I brought the rights back for ten dollars. <laughs> and and worked for the next 14 months to get it back on a syndication. And we found a little distribution company. It was the only one that would agree to do it, and it's called Fremantle. <laughs> okay? So if you've heard of Fremantle today, Fremantle started with, with Baywatch. Tom Beers. And, yeah. Well, Tom, Tom's gone over there now. But, uh, you know, um, and, you know, they now, uh, unfortunately, at the time that we got it back into syndication, we... Uh, even though we're 50-50 partners on it, we gave them the copyright. They wanted the copyright. Who knew? We were just thrilled to get it back on the air. But we lost that copyright, which was, I want to control those kinds of things now. And I think you just have much more control. I just want to throw a little something in. It's interesting. A friend of mine, Aaron Ray, who from The Collective. Are you familiar with Aaron from The Collective? Anyway, their company, they handle all these YouTube stars. He just did a speech just re recently, and they handle all those things. You know the annoying orange? You know the little annoying orange? Yeah, that thing cost between two hundred and fifty dollars to five hundred dollars to make. It became a billion dollar property this year, a billion, a B. That property, the collective. You know the little Fred, the little guy that says, "Hey, you know what? He's up the little guy with the head. He's up to a hundred million dollar valued property now." So the problem. This is the independent. Well, I truly believe, and this is the greatest, greatest time for the independent artist, business person, because you have that direct connect. Copyright. And if, and own, if you own that copyright. audience, copyright. and if you own that audience. If you own that audience, you win because your next products, you can, you know, your next projects, you can go into the audience instead of being one. That's the big deal. The gatekeepers over. There's nobody gatekeeping you being in the media business anymore. That's unbelievable. This is the like, hallelujah, let's go. You know, cheap tools, 
shit, man, you can shoot movies on these damn things now and pay enough <laughs> value. You can. I mean, there's people that are actually using iPhones and making incredible products and doing things. It's it's unbelievable. So, one final question, right here. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much. I feel like I've learned in an hour about crowdfunding more than I've learned in like the past seven years. Wow. Thank you so oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the question is uh, if you consciously, as an independent filmmaker, if you consciously decide that crowdfunding is going to be 50% of your of your budget and then maybe the rest your own money or, or you have already have the money, is it smarter to do it to start from the beginning and say, we don't have money, give me money, and then complete the money you already have at the end, or say, we have a certain amount of money, jump on the moving wagon and help that, us uh, That's that The latter. Yeah, that, that should go in right at the, at the beginning. But the caveat is, let's say you're raising 100 grand, and you know grandma wants to come in for 25 grand because she loves you. You need actually both. You need the money and the marketing. So just having one person put in 25 grand is not the same as having 150 people put in a smaller amount. So you need both the money and the marketing to get that initial momentum. So in theory, you'd have a high number of smaller backers than two people putting in 10, 15 grand and wondering, hey, where's my momentum? Where's everybody else? Where's all the strangers that want to throw money at me? But you do want to front load it at 100%. Big time because that means you know investors want to come in when, when somebody else has already invested. So if you're saying they're there already, then it's like, okay, the risk. You're helping me take the risk that it's going to happen. Packaging and funding. I, I, I have to say I was at a panel earlier today that was marketed as packaging and funding, independent features. They didn't touch on any of it. Very frustrating. And so I'm pleased that you guys think that yeah. this panel did touch on the subject that we were actually advertised <laughs> on. Um, but because, you know, if you can create, uh, get, get some momentum going with crowdfunding um, and, and, are able to, to then package your project. There's so many uh, other ways to to fund movies with soft money, uh, state rebates depending on where you're filming or what you know, treaty deals in Canada or France or wherever. You know, I, I think that 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 those are important elements to also educate yourself on, as well as you know, getting this crowdfunding so that it's a piece because independent movies today are put together in so many different pieces of uh, you know equity and soft money and pre-sales and all those other things but you know crowdfunding if you can get something funded partially with crowdfunding you can probably go out to a foreign sales company or go to different uh, you know uh, events uh, and, and you know uh, uh, what is it the LA film market is coming up you know s sneak into that crash that somehow and start you know uh, pushing your projects if you get the formula right you could probably raise enough money to pay for your next crowdfunding campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not joking no. because people, was it, people are raising money for all sorts of things. So if you think about the idea that it costs money to hire people to do the social media or it hire, costs money to get a publicist or it costs money to get somebody to get you a blog list, you could do a crowdfunding aimed at helping you get the money for that. That's usually when you when you completed that it was a percentage of the money coming in was going to these people yeah. that were working. So But it's again I, I do think it's about connecting with an audience and telling a story that that audience wants to hear. So you know, I have no idea what you're raising the money for. I just think the more you can connect, I think uh, Scott was talking about, you know, having a hundred people who are willing to give you a thousand dollars each, you know, is better than having a million fans who just like you. Yeah, one, well, of the, one of the things I also wanted to bring up, just another alternative a lot of people don't know. Have you ever heard Patreon? Patreon is a different model. It's kind of like, you know, Kickstarter's all this. you got to raise the money, get the campaign. What their model is, is it's that you, you get people to put a monthly figure in. So you can get somebody to put a dollar a month, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month. You're seeing people, eight thousand, ten thousand a month coming in on that site by creating packages so you're delivering content all the time it's a very interesting model because that gets a reoccurring revenue model as opposed to one bump right so for certain types of people if you have a lot of content your stories i mean i could see you doing it really using that model because you got a great funny you know, story and there's a way to kind of tie that in um but that's another really interesting platform way because you know obviously having five or ten grand a month coming in would be nice right to help you <laughs> while you're putting your thing on 
Patron, patron, P A T R P A T R E O N, I believe it is. Well, we're going to have to wrap this up, but I'd like to thank the panel once again for participating. Okay. And thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Oh, that was great. Congratulations to the sun, man. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. So I, well I know you. Yeah. 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 Yes, of course. Oh, yeah. No, it's over. We finished it a year and a half ago, so it's been a while.